Um, I'm Austin Burby, uh, we're from CLA. Uh, Crystal. We'll get some introductions here in just a second. Here to talk about um, just an idea of prospering in a down egg economy. Um, and it's going to be a lot of just takeaways from what we've seen the last several years with a lot of our clients. So a lot of very anecdotal, real life stuff. Um, Can move that down here, a little bit of feedback. There we go. All right, so. Uh, real quick agenda, uh, again, we'll just cover some introductions, and then there's kind of a spattering of different topics we're gonna cover. Um, we're not gonna get into a lot of really granular detail with this stuff, um, far more uh, of kind of a survey of some of these items. So, introduction, Crystal. Sure, I'm Crystal Pollock-Wilson. Uh, for those of you who've been looking in the book, I am not Pat Sturz. We had to have a last minute switch over. Uh, but I've been with, I was with Shank and we were acquired by Clifton Larson Allen in January of last year. And I've been with them up for about 15 years. Uh, some of you may recognize my last name because I am a Wisconsin farmer's daughter. I grew up on my parents' um, dairy farm near Ripon, Wisconsin, uh, that my brother Chris and his wife Kelly, along with my parents Larry and Deb, still operate today. And I work in the egg sector in accounting in Clint at CLA. And uh, Austin Burby, I did not come from a farm background. I actually kind of came into uh, the farming world of tax and accounting. Goodness, we got some feedback. I'm gonna step back here. Um, I came into the farm world of accounting and tax almost by accident, doing a lot of high net worth individuals, estate gift and trust type of work. Um, had a few farm estates that crossed my desk, got me curious, uh, and I started exploring it. And uh, what, what can you say? There's no better group of people to, uh, to serve professionally than, than farmers in the related industries. Um, been with the firm for uh, just under 10 years. Also, uh, again, almost, almost exclusively in ag, uh, really now. Um, a tax guy by trade. They do let me out of the office every once in a while to handicap an audit team like, uh, like she does. <laughs> and I use handicap very, uh, very accurately and judiciously in that sense. They are slowed down by me. Um, so who are we? Uh, we are CLA. Uh, we're a full spectrum uh, professional services firm. We exist purely to create opportunities for our clients. Uh, we do that through industry specialized, industry specific service lines, uh, including wealth advisory, uh, outsourcing, what we call biz ops, kind of your outsourced accounting, HR, payroll, uh, again, very broad spectrum service line there. And then obviously the traditional uh, audit and tax services as well. Um, we're about 6,100 people across the country, 120. Uh, that might actually be 125 offices now. This slide might be just slightly out of date. Um, and then also global affiliations and connections. So we start talking about um, ag and worldwide implications. Obviously, we have arms that reach uh, overseas as well to help out uh, solving issues. So uh, again, just a little bit more background on the firm. Uh, again, who we are. Uh, ag is one of our single biggest sectors as a firm. Uh, again, almost you know, 6,000 approximately agricultural clients, almost 200 professionals in the, uh, in the firm serve the ag team, uh, or serve on our ag team. And again, you can see uh, of that, a lot of it is producer work. A very large chunk of it is producer work. So, um, and especially up here in the upper Midwest where uh, our firms are really uh, heavily located. So by way of background, why are we talking about this? Well, some of it should be pretty obvious, right? Um, this is actual historical data that I took from a client uh, just because he had it and I thought it was pretty neat to look at. Um, so this goes all the way back to January 07, all the way to current. And right, how did we get here? Well, we had 2014, things were looking really, really great. Uh, I think it peaked somewhere about September, of uh, September October-ish of 2014 and about like 2460, somewhere in that neck of the woods. And then by the end of Q1 here uh, of 15, we are down in 15 and change. I just did some really, really quick math because I was curious. Um, and for like a million pounds of production, that's like a $90,000 just one month, two months, you know, uh, top line difference. That's a big deal. Because um, a million pounds is not that big of a dairy, right? So you start talking $100,000 uh, on a small dairy, that is a really big deal. And it happened really, really quick. And then obviously the last five years, um, it's not really improved a whole lot up until recently. Uh, and that's where, you know, when we came up with the concept of this presentation, things still sucked. They were still over here. Um, and then, of course, we kind of come up with this concept for our presentation and the market starts improving and I kind of got to change what it is I want to talk about a little bit. Um, but that's okay. So again, a lot of what we're going to talk about is things that we've seen in real life with our own clients, what they're doing, the conversations they're having with, uh, with their consultants, their bankers, their other professionals, um, maybe what they're doing a little bit differently. And then just some of our own other recommendations, planning ideas, uh, and considerations. 
So again, just by more way of background here, and I probably don't need to even go over these stats, but 2018, lost 638 dairies in just Wisconsin. Uh, 2019, another 818. So if you think about that, that's almost 1,500 families um, or 1,500 dairies that are no longer uh, milk and cows. And there's part of me that mourns that, a very big part of me that mourns that. Now 2020, right? Who knows yet? Uh, we just obviously started. Things don't look that bad right now as we look at the markets and look at uh, the long-term potential. Um, there's certainly still going to be some more fallout from those you know, five years of bad prices. I wouldn't be shocked to see another few hundred dairies close, uh, maybe more. Um, but that's why this conversation is so important, I think. You know, kind of what can we do now, or what have we learned through this time frame, where we might be able to change the answer for some folks. So, um, financial management, kind of first topic here. And I'm gonna just uh, say kudos to Mike, because he covered a couple things on here um, very, very well. You had one of those very first slides where he showed, I can, I can picture it, you know, it basically just like a giant spreadsheet, and there's about a billion numbers on it. Uh, the key point there, majoring in the minors, that is exactly it. So a hearty amen uh, to Mike on that. You have to be paying attention to the small things, the details here. Uh, again, all of my, my most successful dairies over this entire time frame have done one thing uh, in common, that is really pay attention to the very little things. Um, one of those, uh, again, being just trying to run very efficiently. So we start talking about different metrics, right, and big data that's available. Um, controlling costs, trying to be as efficient as possible. One of these first things that we often look at, uh, this feed crop labor custom, and what that is as a percentage of your overall milk check. Um, one common rule of thumb I see is about 60% or less. Uh, so 60% being a good starting point for that number. Um, and if you think about it, the whole idea here is margin, right? The more you have left after covering these things and getting your milk check, the more you have left to service uh, debt, the more you have for rents, means better land, hopefully. Uh, means you got better staff, well, rather not staff. Um, improvements, things of that nature. Again, it's all about margin. Um, one of the other things in terms of efficient operations, just want to highlight appropriate preventative maintenance. Um, when things are bad is not the time to start skimping on your repairs, start skimping on the maintenance. Um, you know, taking the time to do it right, do the job completely, keep the equipment in working order will save you more time and headache and money than just letting it all go to waste, thinking that you're saving money on the front end by not incurring that bill. Uh, so again, really, really important to keep that in mind as you're going through things. Uh, especially when we come to start talking about like parlor maintenance or harvesting equipment, uh, planting equipment. Um, again, that's just, uh, the money there is well spent regardless of how bad the market looks. Uh, another area, uh, the non-financial, or I'll call non-financial KPIs, these key performance indicators. Um, and again, just out of, by show of hands, um, just out of curiosity, and again, I'm trying to like navigate the feedback here, so I apologize, mainly to the camera guy in the very, very back. Uh, but by show of hands, just number of producers versus just other related uh, industries, service providers, number of producers, okay, cool. See, I gave a presentation of like two months ago. Uh, it was a presentation that I didn't put together. Someone else put it together. It was an edict, thou shalt say these things. And about three slides in, I realized 90% of what I was saying was going right over everyone's heads. Uh, it was for the WICPA. So I thought naturally I was speaking to a bunch of accountants. Well, it turns out that was not the case. So important to know the audience. So it's great to see that. So I don't need to tell you what these numbers need to be for your operation. But what I want to reiterate here is understanding how these things impact your financials. And again, a, a big amen to Mike on that. He covered that, uh, again, with one of his other uh, charts, looking very, very granular. What do your prices look like? How does your milk check here change as these factors change? Um, we have some cool data here. Again, I stole this from a client, um, scrubbed his info off of it. He has this going back, I think, all the way to, uh, is it 2009? Got my I notes so. in there. Um, so we got 2009 over here on the right to December 2019 here, 19 here in the current. And he has data for every month, the average fat protein tests, and then the premium dollars on that. Um, and it's actually a pretty fascinating thing to just sit and stare at uh, for a numbers dork like me, and probably Crystal too. Um, 
I think it is really interesting though when we start talking about again, how does your milk check respond, where you note that there's a couple times where these fat and, pro, uh, fat and protein premiums invert. You know, the relationship flips all of a sudden. Well, that's kind of neat. Um, same thing uh, here between the tests and the premiums, where there's a few times where we have our test counts going up, but our premiums going down. Well, again, that's very interesting. Some of that was market driven. Uh, some of that for this specific dairyman um, was a switch in processors, which was also pretty interesting. Um, but again, understanding how your milk check changes with these factors is critical. So knowing your processor, uh, talking to the representatives, understand how is it that you're being paid? How is it that you're being compensated? Something else I thought was really, really neat is I stared at this data. This is completely off the cuff, by the way, too. Um, he expanded right about in here. He uh, basically doubled uh, the number of cows, but with that, he was overcrowded beforehand. And so you can kind of see, you know, to the right, how much his numbers, how much his, uh, his tests fluctuated. And then as the expansion kind of wrapped up and he kind of got into a rhythm, you see all of those tests really came down in the variability. I thought that was fascinating to see. Um, so again, kind of looking at some of the non, uh, again, non-financial production information and how that impacts things. Obviously that expansion really impacted cow comfort and probably a handful of other factors because his numbers improved dramatically after that. Again, I thought that was kind of neat. Um, Another really important thing, uh, and I'm not saying this because a bunch of our bankers are in the room, but know the ratios and the metrics that your banker is actually looking at um, and what is important to them, understand the ranges. So again, just a handful uh, that we're gonna talk about here, you know, your current ratio, your working capital debt to assets, um, current ratio, just a measure of your current assets or your current liabilities. What do you have there? Um, and obviously we wanna have a value greater than one. That means you have more assets than you have liabilities. Um, not a really complex thing. Working capital is a similar measurement that's just normally kept in a dollar's terms. And then debt to assets. Um, again, exactly what it sounds like. How much debt do you have in comparison to the fair market value of your assets? Obviously we wanna keep that number a lot lower. But there's reasonable ranges within all of these things. Um, and I'm sure uh, Crystal could, could echo this. If we're looking at some, some data for a client and you know, their current ratio is three, four, five, six, and their working capital uh, number dollar value is gigantic, I'm probably gonna step back and scratch my head a little bit and say, why? Why are you sitting on so much cash, for example? Uh, why aren't we doing something more productive with it? Or, gosh, does it make sense to maybe use some of this leverage, you know, some of this equity that you have and leverage it appropriately to do some things you need to do around here. Um, so too much can be a good thing, or rather too much of a good thing isn't necessarily the answer we want either. So understand again, the ranges that your banker would like to see, understand what they mean to your operation, work inside of those boundaries. I emphasize what Austin is coming to say about just understanding what those ratios mean. Anybody can do a calculation and just see what those numbers are, but until you actually really understand what it means for you and means for parties that are outside of you, whether it is your banker or whether it is the processor that's taking your milk, because all of all the operations that you have and all of these ratios is going to significantly impact you and it's going to significantly impact all of those customers to you as well as those vendors. Um, because I'll tell you in any business business, and let's face it, whether or not we're on a family farm or we're on a corporate op we're operating farm, we're all still a business. And as a business, our vendors are wanting to be able to look at some of our financial ratios, and they want to make sure that you are a good, stable, viable business for you or for them, so that they will continue to, to sell to you. Um, so it's very important that you understand really what these ratios are for you and what it means for you. And I think this is another spot to just reiterate how important the relationship with the banker really is. Um, I mean, I, I can't stress that enough, having seen a lot of farms now start going through transition processes. Um, and we'll actually talk about that a little bit as well uh, in a couple later slides here. But again, mm -hmm. really need to have a strong relationship with the banker. Um, I, again, just from an outsider's perspective, uh, third party, again, I'm not in a dairy, I'm not running a dairy, I service dairies, I see these relationships, uh, very, very important. 
Uh, some other financial management types of uh, numbers and things that we're looking at, uh, accrual net income. So here, think of your cash basis P&L, but now we're gonna adjust it for some of your receivables. We're gonna adjust it for your payables. We're gonna adjust for changes in the fair market value of maybe your crop inventories, your herd inventories. Why? Well, your banker wants to understand, and your accountant and your dairy consultant also kind of like to understand too, what is the actual value being driven by the operation? Not just the net cash, while that's extremely important, and we talk about that in another slide here coming up, uh, the actual value being driven by the operation, right? Because that's again gonna help the banker understand what is your ability to pay. Um, Budget versus actual, here's where the accounting dorks uh, get all hot and bothered. Um, budget versus actual implies, first of all, that you have a budget and that it's meaningful. Uh, you'd be shocked. Uh, we gave a presentation very similar to this several years ago, and uh, I asked the question, who had a budget? And there was like four people in a room about this size that raised their hands. Uh, my jaw nearly hit the floor. Uh, it's like, I can't believe that's even a thing. Um, everyone that I work with, has budgets, it's a monthly budget, there's an annual budget. You need to have a budget, you need to make sure it's reasonable, make sure it makes sense, it can't be pie in the sky. The other big thing with a budget, it means nothing if you keep moving the goalposts. Um, I just had a conversation with a client and uh, it's hilarious um, because she goes, you know, we keep meeting our budget every year and then one of our staff goes, well, that's because you change your accruals at year end so that the numbers work out that you meet the budget. And that's not really much of a budget. And uh, she had a very unentertained look on her face by that comment, but my staff was absolutely correct. The budget means nothing if you just keep moving the numbers, moving the, that budgeted number via accruals and different changes like that. But why is that important? Well, it tells you what you're doing right. It tells you what you're doing wrong. Uh, it tells you maybe where there was something unexpected. Right? Talk about a really powerful tool uh, I had a dairyman uh, share with me this spring, uh, just after he'd gotten, uh, we got all the tax returns done for him, got everything cleaned up, gave him the entries, and he actually ran an updated budget to actual for the year, and he identified like five things um, in terms of where he missed, you know, where he really just swung and missed, or what happened. And he was able to break those things down very, very specifically. Here's what happened. Okay, we, we all, uh, you know, why was our feed cost so high? Well, we were feeding about 200 extra head. We thought we were gonna have an opportunity to market a bunch of cattle. It fell through. Okay, makes sense. But along with that, he also had in there, what are we gonna do differently? How is the next year's budget adjusted for those things? Now, you know, we talk about a powerful tool. Uh, if you're a dairyman here and you have a budget to actual and you can explain all those major variances, that's a pretty powerful tool when you go then and have a conversation with your banker, um, needing you know, uh, to up the line or to get some sort of short-term borrowing to make something happen. If you can go in there and say, here's what happened, here's what we're doing about it, again, very, very powerful. Um, the other thing on here, cost production. And again, Mike hit this right on the head. Uh, you really, really, really need to understand your cost of production. Why? Because until you understand the cost of production, either on a 100 weight basis or as a percent of milk check or as a dollar value of that milk check, um, you can't begin any kind of marketing. Uh, you have no idea where to even start. And again, he covered that, so we're just gonna leave that there and, uh, and skim on by it. But four, I'll say, if I'm just gonna break it down to a few pieces to focus on, I'm gonna look at probably just these three things as kind of uh, higher level metrics to start getting an understanding. Again, I'm getting feedback, so I'm gonna migrate here. It's like a moving target. Um, your overall cash operating costs on a per hundred weight basis. Your interest and in principal payments on a per hundred weight basis. And then that total cash break even uh, price on a hundred weight basis. Again, really important when you start looking at how do you plan? How do you market? The one thing I'll emphasize here too is just to Austin's comment about doing this per hundred weight or per year percentage of gross milk. It's really important to get that baseline that you're comparing to because the problem is say you're going through a herd expansion or say you're going through a herd de depletion, you're getting rid of some cows. Be if you can make it so that it's equivalent to that per hundred weight or as a percent of gross milk, it'll help you see your internal trends to be able to know, you know, for this hundred pounds of milk, this is really what it cost me. And it doesn't matter if I'm milking 200 cows or 500 cows or 2000 cows. You get that nice baseline for consistency and comparisons from year to year and period to period. Yeah. The other reason to break it down into the hundred weight basis is your banker probably has data. Your dairy consultant probably has data that you can use for benchmarking. So. And hopefully if you're working with them closely, this stuff is already being done and broken down in that manner anyway. Um, 
I think one of our last slides on financial management. Um, the other big thing here I want us to talk about cash flow planning. Again, as we look at 2020, we do see things improving dramatically for a lot of our folks. Um, that said, got to stay disciplined. Have to stay disciplined. Uh, farmers, we pick on them in the tax world because there's this kind of uh, theme that runs across most all of them that I work with. Uh, if there's like a dollar of income, they want to spend it to get rid of it because they don't like paying tax. That is a bad answer. Uh, the tax guy says that's a bad answer. So stay disciplined. If it's not on the budget, do whatever you can to avoid having to incur that expense. Obviously, things come up, and sometimes those you know, exceptions have to be made, um, but it's important. Stay disciplined. On that same token, or on that same note, uh, cash flow out the future. Uh, I think this is a really interesting exercise. We've started doing this a bit more for people. Um, not just on a monthly basis. You know, a lot of our uh, consultants that we work with will help their dairies set up a monthly cash basis budget, and that's awesome. But one of the other things that we're starting to look at doing is doing this now in a multi-year. Spread that thing out. Where do your debt service payments all of a sudden start ballooning? How does that uh, how does that change cash flow? Where are your fixed asset replacements going to have to occur on that same time frame? You know, do those things line up? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Interesting exercise though to see where you might run into some traps or some pitfalls down the road. Um, Others, is, uh, ideas or concepts within cash flow planning, you know, focus on rebuilding the equity with that cash flow. Um, that's huge. Again, we have an uptick in the market. In theory, a lot of our folks should be doing really well through 2020. Again, on paper, at least, it looks like that. Um, so focus on rebuilding that equity. And again, I'm going to um, yell a little bit at the farmers, uh, tax planning. Normal habits don't save tax. Um, if your accountant tells you that, they're lying to you. They don't save tax, just the first tax. All we're doing is kicking the can down the road. And that might make sense in moderation and in certain circumstances, but again, at the end of the day, all you're doing is moving that, that tax liability down the road. At some point, you will pay it. Now, when you have years like we did in 2017 to 2018 where we had tax reform, there was true tax savings because we had rates slide down about 3% on average on the individual side. Uh, businesses, you know, corp went from 35% all the way down to 21% for a lot of people. Okay, that, are, that is true tax savings. But our normal habits of just using prepay or buying some equipment doesn't save taxes, just defers taxes. And does that make sense? If we're burning cash, does that really make sense? Again, it could. It could certainly make sense for the operation, but don't just take that and run with it every year. Um, so on that, income tax planning, what do we recommend then? If we said that's the bad way, what's the good way? Well, um, I look at things a lot more long-term, a lot more big picture. So being really, really intentional about why we're doing things and how we're doing it. Um, so again, just a few factors to think about here. We have really, really low tax rates, historically low tax rates. Uh, I don't think any of the accountants in the room or in this building think that rates are gonna go down from here on out. Uh, quite frankly, if the Senate and the White House were to flip to blue, I would expect the rates to come up very, very quickly, maybe even as early as 2021. Who knows? Because um, tax law is only permanent until it's not, because that's just how it is. So again, we have historically low rates, including cap gains rates. Um, the other thing to think about before we kind of dive into a couple of these things, long-term tax strategies. Do we have a succession plan coming up? Uh, do we have a retirement for maybe an off-farm job coming up to consider? That makes things really interesting. Um, so let's just come back here to this historically low tax rate idea I'm here. So again, we have about as low of individual rates as we're gonna get, likely. Uh, we have really low cap gains rates. Does it make sense now to start leaving some income on a tax return? I can tell you the bankers in the room would probably like to see a little tax, uh, little income on the tax return. Um, Long-term strategies to consider, again, do we have succession planning? Well, there's a lot that can be done from an income tax perspective to help out with the succession plan or transition plan. And same thing with opportunities to amend returns. Um, we've seen this a lot, we see this a lot when we pick up new clients where we look at Schedule J, farm income averaging. And a lot of the tax softwares, the way they work is they only bring income as you spread that across the Schedule J. They only bring that income to like the bottom of that bracket, which means you're wasting the rest of that tax bracket. And what you end up having are these little peaks on this schedule where you can't really get over them without increasing tax. Well, that becomes a problem if all of a sudden you have a really good year and you're trying to spread income out, you have maybe a down year and another up year, 
you can't spread that income over that other up year that you had a few years ago. So maybe there's an opportunity to go back, amend some returns, bring down that average income across those years and be able to spread some of it a little bit better. Um, we end up doing that pretty frequently. The other big thing from a tax planning, and this is getting a little bit more to current tax planning, um, 2019, watch for loss limitations. Uh, a couple of these things are changes from tax reform. So net operating losses created in 2018, 2018 and after have limits to what you can use on an annual basis on your income tax return. Now, my suspicion is uh, if you have losses, they probably go back before 18. And so it's probably a non-issue from that perspective um, this year. Um, but something certainly to watch going forward. The other thing, uh, self-employment tax trap. Uh, this one I see more frequently. People think, oh, well, I've got that loss from the prior year. I got income this year. Just a complete wash, right? No. Uh, Self-employment tax will still be an issue. and You don't want to have all of a sudden a 15.5% surprise uh, on that income when you thought you were going to have nothing and hadn't planned for it. So current year planning ideas, what do we do? I talked about the rates being really, really low. Um, I'm going to make an argument for a lot of our clients. Let's leave capital gains on the tax returns. You can leave about $110,000 of cap gains on your tax return if you're married, filing joint, and still pay zero tax. That's a pretty powerful tool because that's $110,000 less approximately that you have to spend to zero out income and get to that same tax result. Well, that's extra cash in your pocket, something that you can do something uh, productive with. Um, Again, avoiding loss limitations with section 179. Again, uh, with the limitations on what you can use for a net operating loss on a go forward basis, there's a school of thought that says, well, if we're gonna be at a loss anyway, why not take section 179, expense those assets. I think most people here are probably familiar with that concept uh, using section 179. Now, it's not gonna create a loss and you're not gonna be able to use all of that it'll get suspended and carry over to the next year. Well, then what happens next year when you have income? All of it frees up in its entirety. So an example, say here in 2019, we're doing tax returns, and last year you had a million dollar loss, okay? This year, we have a million dollars of income. Most of us in the room will be thinking, well, hey, those just offset, nothing to worry about. Wrong, 80% of that NOL is all that you can be able to use. So we're gonna be left with a couple hundred thousand dollars of income in the current year. Now, if we, take this a year forward and say, okay, well, what if in 18, instead of creating a not operating loss, we had taken a million dollars of section 179 and it all carried on over. As we come into 19, we have a million dollars of section 179 carryover that'll offset dollar for dollar all of that income. Uh, we just saved $200,000, tax on $200,000, uh, 24% probably, give or take, depending on the rest of the factors in the tax return. It's a lot of cash that all of a sudden now you're keeping on your tax, uh, keeping in your pocket, I should say. Plan to maximize uh, the QBI slash 199A deduction. This could be an entire seminar in itself, so we're not going to dive into that. Um, I've made it an entire seminar. Um, qualified business income deduction, right? Really, really high level, 20% deduction on your business income. Uh, this was put in place. We can actually thank Ron Johnson for holding out here in Wisconsin uh, before he would sign the Tax Act. He demanded essentially that we get some parity between our pass through entities, our partnerships, our S Corps, our individual tax returns, and the corporate structure, right? C Corps got that nice drop down to a 21% flat rate. Ron Johnson said, well, that's all great, but. 95% of the businesses in this country are past their entities. What are we gonna do for them? And so that's what they came up with. But a huge opportunity, because again, that's 20% deduction on the income that doesn't reverse. It's not like depreciation where it's kind of a sugar high, right? You get it that one year, and then unless you keep spending money every year, you're not gonna get it anymore. That's just 20% right on off. Now there's a bunch of different limitations that come into play. So again, uh, we could cover an entire seminar uh, worth of material talking about that but work intentionally with your CPA, with your accountant, to be able to maximize this. Uh, the rules get really interesting when we start talking about multiple entities. And again, most of our operations now are set up with you know, a separate land holding company, maybe a separate equipment company, separate operating entity that's actually just doing the milking or maybe a holding company in there. Again, the structures are getting more and more complex. And there's some ways that you can combine and aggregate and make some elections to maximize that deduction. So that's more of just informational work with your accountant specifically on these issues. 
Um, the other thing is tax planning and loss years. We don't really think about it all that much. But there's some really, really smart things you can do in a loss year to set yourself up in a position uh, to just better yourself, I guess, in the future. Uh, probably a simple way to put it. Deferring income and expenses, right? Again, if we start talking about do we need to create all these losses? Well, if we're not going to be able to use them in the next year um, or there's going to be limits to what we can use in the next year, does it make sense to try to push some of them to the next year? Um, either by actually not cutting the check on your end, holding the check, or certain elections that we can make on a tax return. We can do some of that after the fact for you. Same thing with capitalizing expenses. Um, you know, we've got, I got uh, Derry that I've worked with the last few years. He's not had any repairs and maintenance expense because it's all been put right back onto the balance sheet. We're just capitalizing it because there's no need to take that deduction and just increase the loss number that he has. So instead, we're trying to spread it out a little bit for him. The other thing, um, for our loss years, we have carrybacks still as an option. Farms got to keep this with tax reform. Everyone else got to lose it, so lucky you guys. Two years, you can go back and carry losses. So um, I would, again, suspect that over the last few years, most of our operators in the room probably had losses um, and not income to be able to carry back to. But if you are one of the few who did really, really well and now all of a sudden you're looking at having some tax losses, that's an option that's out there. And I think the overarching theme of all of this from a tax planning perspective is be intentional, be proactive. I um, just want to reiterate that. We can do a lot of after the fact tax planning, but the options and the results are almost always better when we're brought in on the front end to help navigate and plan and be intentional on it versus trying to do it on the back end. So um, strategic planning questions. And again, this is stuff that's very real life. Um, I have a lot of clients talking about this. Uh, I see a lot of the bankers uh, probably not like that very first bullet point expansion analysis. Um, I'm not advocating for it, uh, but is it a worthwhile exercise? I think it is, and I'd argue our dairies should probably be looking at that. Running the numbers, uh, if nothing else, for their own peace of mind, but I think it's a good thought exercise. What would it take to actually make it profitable? I think you'll find out a lot about your operation if you really study the metrics and the numbers behind that to make it work. Um, probably more practical, you know, this question of buying versus raising. Um, there's a lot of anecdotal discussion and, and kind of thoughts on that. And I think, well, actually I know because we've ran some analysis and I'll show an example. Uh, you know, I kind of had my preconceived, here's what I think the answer is. And uh, we actually had dairymen say, you know what, I want to actually see what it would mean for me. Okay, well, let's do it. Um, and I'll kind of show you what that looks like here in a second because I thought it was really interesting. Um, but that's another really great thought exercise and uh, a great, uh, again, process to go through. Other investments, I think it's probably the most practical part of all this right now, right? So manure handling equipment, uh, planting and harvest equipment, you know, we have a lot of people looking at the cost of the custom hire, plus all of the delays, especially this last year that we ran into with weather. Um, is it worthwhile to just get the equipment and do it yourself now? Well, uh, I've seen a few people make really, really compelling arguments. Um, one of them uh, it worked out extremely well for him this last year. Uh, there's a couple of people here in the room that work with this particular individual, um, probably know exactly who I'm talking about. Uh, it made a lot of sense for him, it made a lot of sense for him. Um, I have another one investigating the same question right now. And uh, last year we had the conversation with him. We told him from the planting side, you know, here's the max you can spend and have this thing still make sense from a dollars and cents perspective. The rest of it's going to come. Can you come down to? Can you fill you know that tractor seat uh, in the spring to be able to do it? And he was able to. That made sense. Now he's exploring the manure side of it. Um, I'll be curious to see what we come up with there. Uh, another one, you know, the robots and the rotary systems. We hear this conversation a lot as well. Again, I think it's a worthwhile analysis. Um, I've not had anybody personally take the jump into this yet, uh, though I'm really excited. I want someone to do it just because I'm a dork and I want to go in there and see it. Um, I have no problem saying that. But again, really worthwhile thought exercises. And as we come to, a, come to another topic, um, this is a great area to get your next generation. If you're working through a succession plan, this is a great opportunity to get them involved uh, and have them do it because chances are um, people in my generation are probably better at using Excel and spreadsheets and all that stuff than the rest of you guys are. Um, so this is a perfect job for them to start working on it. So that buy versus raise example, oh, look at that. You can actually read it, not too bad, cool. I was worried, it's a very busy slide. Um, so again, I had, I had a client come to me and say, 
so what? I, I want to see some actual numbers behind this. You know, does it really make sense? And so we sat down uh, on the phone for probably 25, 30 minutes and said, all right, let's just kind of do a data dump. And so this is all based on his numbers, uh, his assumptions, his call rates, his death rates, everything. About the only thing we couldn't really factor in is quality between his herd and any kind of replacement herd that he was buying. And about the only thing you can do there is adjust that purchase price of the cattle. If you're gonna buy cows, obviously the higher you put that dollar, in theory, the better quality animal you're going to get. So again, we did this uh, early spring when prices were still down substantially. This number probably looks substantially different now, uh, but I think that's partially why it's so important to actually consider these things. Um, so again, you can see over on the left-hand side, we had raised cattle, um, kind of that net cost after tax, trying to factor in, okay, if you're selling animals, if you're, you're, um, you're getting returns on those things, you're paying tax on them, versus purchasing, okay, we're buying them, but we're depreciating them, we're also gonna sell some on the back end. Uh, again, what does that all mean? For him, buying cows saved him nearly $600 a cow based on this analysis. That's a big number. Even on a small dairy, that adds up really, really quick. So, is it a perfect analysis? No. Is it directionally correct? I'd like to think so. Um, so that's pretty powerful information. Um, and again, you can see a lot of, uh, over here on the right, a lot of our assumptions that he gave us. Say, so, okay, what, you know, what is your cycle on these things? Again, what is your call rate? Now, if you went to just all buying, you know, how would you breed? Would you breed all to beef? Would you keep some as replacements uh, and, and have you know, maybe 10% bread to dairy still? And so we factored all that in for him. So again, this isn't an end all be all uh, of the argument. This is just one particular dairy. And again, I would suspect um, at $1,300 a head, we should probably adjust this for him and say, okay, now if you want a really quality animal to make sure you're still producing the kind of milk that you had been, because he'd always raised his own, we should probably bump that number up and see what the numbers show now. Um, but again, really, really interesting thought exercise. These types of exercises too circle back to why it's so important to keep some of those key performance indicators and keep some history you have on your books. Because that way when you want to do these analysis or analyses, you'll have that information readily available for you. You don't have to go back and try to dig information up from some box in the back of the attic. If you keep it if you keep your records really good from year to year, you'll be able to run these analyses without having to do a significant amount of work. All right, succession planning. Um, I could easily make this one an entire seminar and a half. Uh, I will refuse to do so today. Um, I don't want this to be a succession planning seminar, but I, we do need to throw it out here. And I, I guess the kind of the question I'd be asking is why, right? Um, if we're talking about prospering in a down, down ag economy and, and how do we set ourselves up for success, plan for success, why is this even on here? Well, number one, I'd say we have a lot of opportunity right now. Um, with the market the way it is, with uh, the spot that interest rates are at, tax rates are at, um, values of everything is still depressed, relatively speaking. There's a lot of opportunity for succession planning right now. So again, worthwhile to be thinking about. And frankly, as farmers age, um, the average age of the farmer, I think, is now about the age of Moses. Um, we need to be thinking about this far more intentionally than we have been. Um, and I'm gonna even go so far as to say, we need to start grooming the gener next generation right now. Um, actually wrote an article on this a while back. Um, if you just hop onto our website, the big transition, I did not come up with the title. Some other highly paid people come up with all the titles on these things, but getting the next generation involved in farm management. Um, wrote an article uh, kind of covering like four or five really high level things that you can do right now to start getting the next generation involved. Um, again, one of them we were talking about doing some of that planning, some of that strategic planning, stuff that maybe you've done in the past, um, but with a fresh set of eyeballs, some new skill sets, some new technology, maybe you find some interesting answers, I don't know. But if nothing else, it's a great way to get that next generation engaged, get them thinking about what it means to be an owner of an, an operator of a dairy, right? Because uh, there's very different things uh, when you start talking about working on a dairy, living on a dairy, and owning and operating it, and having your name on that sign out front. Um, and again, we talk about the opportunity here. So uh, capitalizing on opportunities to transfer these assets at a reduced cost. Right now, we have a lifetime uh, gift and estate exemption of about $11.4 million per person. That's a lot of stuff that you can give away without paying a dime of tax. So again, if you think about a married filing joint couple, that's you know, $22.8 million. 
worth a farm that you could give away potentially, um, if it makes sense. So a lot of what I'm looking at with clients and talking about with clients is this combination, you know, gifting, selling. At the same time, we can give it all away. I kind of want Junior to have some skin in the game. That way, if he throws a temper tantrum, he can't just pack up his toys and go play in a different sandbox, right? It's going to hurt if he wants to walk away. We want him to buy into it. Um, the other area where we have this opportunity is land versus operations. Maybe there's some creative ways to get the next generation involved, um, get them some skin in the game of the operation, but mom and dad still hold all the land. You know, they still have that major asset because the other part of it is, with $22 million, almost $23 million of an estate exemption, that's a really nice step up at their passing. Not that we want mom and dad to die, but dying can solve a lot of tax problems. So sometimes that's a good answer uh, when it comes to taxes. So again, this is not a succession planning seminar, but there are some really high level concepts that we want to be thinking about and planning for. One other comment that uh, Austin and I had previously talked about too was just making sure that in the next generation, if you have a next generation that's coming in, you allow them to make mistakes and really use this transition period as an opportunity to let them make mistakes. Some of my most successful clients have had that next generation transfer and as part of that transfer, they've made some doozies of mistakes. But I tell you that they've learned so much from those mistakes. So as mom and dad, don't try to you know, completely cover your kids as they're trying to make those decisions. Let them make some mistakes. That's how we all learn. Um, so that's worked really well for a lot of our clients. Now, if it's something that's going to bankrupt you, obviously try to provide some guidance. Um, but let them start making some small decisions, whether it's starting with deciding what crops you're going to plant, or maybe it's what type of seed you're going to plant or where things are going to go for a certain year. Have those conversations. You know, if it surrounds those smaller decisions, it'll help them to be able to make those bigger decisions in the long run. Yeah, yeah, excellent point. So um, kind of the last major uh, topic, we just want to talk about risk management and not from the standpoint, again, that Mike, uh, Mike North was talking about, a little bit different risk management. And again, this is stuff that we see um, very real life, very practically in our own client groups. Uh, data and IT security. It is a very scary world out there right now. Um, one of the single most common phone calls that we get right now, I think as a firm, in terms of service offerings, is an IT security. Penetration testing, security awareness training, um, and there's a few others, uh, CLA people in the, in the room that can appreciate all of our phishing attempt emails that we get all the time, our own IT group testing us, you know, click on this link and you'll win, you know, whatever. Uh, you'd be shocked at how bad our rates still are, frankly. Uh, it's kind of sad. But data and IT security, huge. Uh, back up that data. I don't know how many farmers I work with, they have one computer, and that's it, and it's never been backed up. And if that computer were to crash right now, they would be toast. Um, especially, again, if we start talking about all that historical data that's available and how powerful that is important to back up your data. And again, the other part, cyber attacks, ID theft, etc. cetera. Um, the cyber attacks, the phishing, they're not just targeting, the people that do that are not just targeting big companies. They're targeting small operations, uh, small churches in the middle of you know southern Minnesota, as one example, actually a client of ours um, that had that happen several years ago. Um, so again, it's not just big companies. It's everybody is at risk for this. So. Plan for it. Put safeguards in place, back up your data, use passwords, use strong passwords. There's a bunch of different tools out there, different apps you can get that will generate random passwords for you and store the key ones for you uh, securely. The other one, um, and again, I've had a lot of calls on this one now, or a lot of conversations on this one now, physical security. Um, I think everyone remembers Fairlife Farms. Um, Man, that was a really interesting time uh, to kind of just sit back and watch what was happening. Now, I think their response was you know, entirely appropriate, and I don't think they had too much you know, negative fallout from it. Um, but that started raising a lot of questions. I had a lot of people asking me, you know, do you know someone that does cameras? You know, do you know someone that can upgrade the cameras we have? Maybe throw a DVR system in there. Gosh, what about our employee system? You know, our, our system of vetting employees is it good enough? That physical security uh, question took on a whole different turn, a whole different note and, and uh, conversation after that. Now, and, and this is one of the things as we were putting this together, this presentation, Crystal made an excellent point though. You have to balance that security though with sharing your story. Um, again, I think a lot of the opportunity that we're gonna have 
uh, in the dairy world. And Kim, Brem Kim Bremer talks about this a lot, and I know she's presented here on several occasions and at the Corn Soy Expo, uh, which will be up in a couple weeks. You know, she's talking about sharing ag's story to the world because we have so few people that grew up on farms anymore uh, that actually understand where their food comes from and the products they buy, where that comes from. Dairy as a whole, ag as a whole, needs to do a better job at sharing that. So we have to balance that physical security need with getting people, getting the public to engage you on your farm. Um, it's huge. The other one, uh, labor and HR compliance. Again, I, I probably don't need to tell anyone in this room that this is a very, very scary world. Uh, labor is a huge issue, obviously, in the dairy side of things, especially with all the immigration issues. Um, but still very, very important. Um, you have to pay attention to this stuff. And you need to put safeguards in place to protect yourself. Um, the other big thing uh, with that, again, not just on the immigration side and, and understanding who you're hiring, but also on the staffing side and the retention side, having good documents in place, actually having an employee handbook. Um, better yet is having an employee handbook that your employees can read. Uh, I had an operator that had an employee handbook um, in English. Uh, all of his staff spoke Spanish and only Spanish. Um, so that was kind of problematic. Uh, I had to have one of our teams come on in and translate his entire employee handbook for him once we pointed that out. But again, uh, HR is another huge, huge risk area that we need to be more intentional about safeguarding ourselves against. So, um, you know, in conclusion, again, I think the big part of this is um, being proactive. Don't be reactive. Uh, as much as we can, we need a plan for success. Obviously, there are certain things that are outside of control. Uh, again, Mike pointed out, we cannot control the weather. We cannot control when we're going to get those crops in the ground, what that's going to mean for forage quality, uh, or any of our other feed quality. Um, but we need to be proactive as best we can. We need to plan for that current success. Again, setting up intelligent budgets, sticking to them, being disciplined best we can. And then planning for the future. I think probably the biggest uh, item within planning for the future, start the succession planning conversation now. Uh, I cannot stress that enough. Uh, you do not want to be on the back end of having a, um, as an example, this was, you know, again, real life. Had a client come to us several years ago, said bad news, late stage cancer diagnosis. What do we do? Told them to buckle up. And uh, we put together in place and we were able to transfer the farm and when he eventually passed, um, everything was okay from that standpoint. But that was rushed and it just happened to work out uh, pretty favorable for him. But that's a success story out of a lot of other failures that we've seen and been a part of uh, on similar issues. So again, be proactive on that. So with that, um, questions, comments? I'm gonna direct concerns to her and I'll just walk off, but questions? I'm standing between you and lunch, which is like the second most dangerous spot to be in the day, right between you and the beer and cheese tasting. So, um, and then Mike went over, so I moved through Mach 1 here, but questions by all means. And if you guys would rather go to lunch, um, we'll hang out for a little bit. You can come on up and we can let the rest go. So, okay, hearing none. Thank you, everybody. Uh, lunch, I believe, is out and down. Right, thank you. I'll leave that up there.